Hello everyone, welcome. Today is the 11th of January 2024 and in the morning I was following the um, hearing at the International Court of uh, Justice between uh, the, uh, this, uh, the, the dispute or the complaint rather of South Africa against uh, Israel. Today we heard from the South African side and tomorrow we will hear from the Israeli defense. And the talk about uh, was about whether um, genocide is taking place or the probability of at least considering that this must, must be taking place. And I thought to go back to the past as I usually do and see if we can find something in history that may uh, teach us something or we might learn something from it. Uh, first of all, um, geno uh, genocide in the ancient world, did it exist? The concept itself, or the word itself, is recent. It was coined in 1944 by Raphael Lemsky in his book The Axis Rule in Occupied Europe. Uh, and this was closely associated with what had happened in, uh, with the Holocaust and other com uh, campaigns of extermination waged against specific groups of people. But the United Nations definition does not confine this only to such instances. The definition is this, the official one. Genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. A. Killing members of the group. B. Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. This is the UN Convention for the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide of the 9th of December 1948. Now in the ancient world, which is what I'm going to be talking about here, national could mean city since city-states were the primary political entity in most parts of the ancient world and in classical Greece certainly. And the means of destruction besides killing meant also the collective sale into slavery. So did genocide exist in the ancient world? Yes of course it did. The legendary sack of Troy, which ended with the killing of men and the enslavement of women and children, for example. I have been uh, reading a paper written by Hans van Ves, uh, and he says that one of his editors, or the referees of the paper, complained, or pointed out at any rate, that you cannot compare the past to what is happening nowadays. And this referee says, and I'm quoting, comparing the atrocities of the sack of Troy to those, to those of modern ethnic cleansing seems to be a stretch, equating mythical acts of heroic violence to very unheroic modern behavior. So he was saying, no, it did not exist. But is this so? The intent to destroy a national group as such 
was present then and it is being argued today before the International Court of Justice uh, in the Israel-Gaza conflict and in the complaint put forward by the state of South Africa. As I said, we heard their complaint today. It has happened before, so I thought it appropriate to bring the past into the present again and see if the past, as always, has something to teach us, something we can learn from. Because I said this many times, as I go into the past, human nature does not change. We might love and hate and cry and laugh at different things, but we continue to love and hate and laugh and cry. Uh, history is not a continual, horizontal, deterministic line of progress advancing always towards a perfect uh, society, an utopia. Rather, we seem to be always going back in circles, and here we are again. Now, going back, the Greeks uh, had their own word for it. They call it anastasis, literally meaning raising up. That is to say, forcing a community to get up and leave its home from driving uh, an unharmed population uh, out of its territory to the ultimate fate of execution or enslavement. Even in its mildest form, it entailed scattering a city's population and turning them into refugees and as such would still fall nowadays under the UN definition clause C and I repeat from the official definition of clause C quote deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part under the UN definition of genocide, Gaza may not be the only group in recent memory to have suffered this punishment. And we have to take into account the English translation of raising up or removal or even uprooting fails to bring out the sheer violence involved with the words the, the word of the word genocide the, the 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 intense emotion of violence that this word evokes so genocide genocide is not new it occurred also in the ancient world, albeit under different conditions. Let's, let's uh, look back and see if we can learn something from the past. First, the ancient uh, rhetoric of genocide, one of them would be cutting open pregnant women. We see that in quite a few places. When a Greek historian claims for example, that a city was razed to the ground and its population massacred. Is this a record of actual genocide or merely a boast that the enemy suffered an overwhelming defeat? We do not have enough evidence, but even if we were if it were poetic license. The rhetoric is valuable, nevertheless, because it reveals ancient ideologies of genocide. And in his paper, the paper that I just mentioned, uh, Genocide and the Ancient World, Hans van Vez says, and I quote, During the first battle described in the Iliad, Agamemnon notices that Menelaus is about to spare the life of a Trojan captive, so he runs over and shouts to his brother, quote, 
Not a single one of them must, must escape sheer destruction at our hands. Not even if a mother carries one in her belly and he is male, not even he should escape. Altogether, they must be exterminated from Troy. Their bodies untended to and invisible. And I said, end of quote. And I said human nature in the sense, human hatred towards the other has not changed much. In a civilized society nowadays even, there it is under the surface, you scratch it a little bit and raw hatred just might appear. Think of those dead under the rubble and Homer's Iliad, and the Iliad was written in 750 BC, we think. They must all be exterminated from Troy, their bodies untended to and invisible. And I have seen videos of people now in 2024 looking for the dead under the rubble and being bombed while doing so. But let's continue. Similar instances appear in Assyrian and Babylonian poems and in the Bible too, where the victors, quote, cut open pregnant women. In an Assyrian poem from 1100 BC, we see this, quote, he slits the wombs of pregnant women, he blinds the infants, he cuts the throats of their strong ones, whoever offends the god Ashur will be turned into a ruin. And we find the same images in reverse order in biblical prophecies. Quote, Samaria shall bear, her shall bear her fruit, because she has rebelled against God. They shall fall by the sword. Their little ones shall be dashed in pieces, and their pregnant women ripped open. And that is Hosea 14.1. When I read this as a Catholic, I have to point out, however, that for us, the Messiah came, God made man, and his teaching would be different, not one of revenge, but a warning, perhaps, ultimately one of love. If you live by the source, remember, you will die by the source, teaching us not to live by the sword. But, but the mutilation of pregnant women is here not a random atrocity, but part of the same systematic violence. Adults will be killed by the sword, children beaten to death or blinded as to make them helpless, and babies ripped from their mother's wombs or killed now in incubators. The message is the same as in the Iliad. The entire enemy population must be destroyed, even the unborn. This is talk of genocide, this talk in, in the past. But genocide should not, not include every instance of large-scale killing in war countless sieges which cause human huge damage and loss of life uh, but for example did not end the entire population these should be excluded from genocide also to be excluded are massacres committed for example by soldiers running amok and wiping out perhaps entire towns without being ordered to do so, or even in defiance of orders to stop killing. Only when 
the population of a city was executed or dispersed by the design of military or political authorities, thus the label genocide seemed appropriate. The massacre of all the inhabitants was quite rare though, although not unknown. More typical was the execution of all free men of military age, while women, children and slaves were sold into further slavery. The youngest children and the elderly, the very young and the very old, were usually spared, often because they were of no use as slaves. They would often find no buyer, and so left to die of exposure, hunger, or attack by wild animals. A final target for destruction was the city itself. The purpose of, of uh, physical destruction of buildings and land was to obliterate not only the enemy, but even the memory of their existence. Ideally, victims were to be eliminated without leaving any trace at all. Notwithstanding all this in the ancient world, peace, however, was always considered the norm and ideal even if it was often interrupted by uh, the necessary evil of war. When war did break out, its goals usually stopped well short of annihilating the enemy. Wars could be concluded with pacts of non-aggression, treaties of equal alliance, or unequal treaties which imposed terms on the defeated side and sometimes with the elimination of a city's leadership or as we read the aristocracy the leadership the leaders the rebels the rebels that is cities which in some way offended the terms of their subordination or sometimes simply refused to be subordinated in a famous uh, passage, the great historian Thucydides, the father of history, I think, um, he, he wrote the Peloponnesian War between the Athenians and the Spartans. And he writes of the Athenian assembly debating the pros and cons of killing only the responsible members of the rebels, he calls it the aristocracy, the leaders, the responsible members of the rebels versus massacring the entire population of Athens, uh, the, uh, of Athens uh, ally, uh, Mytilene. The Athenians decided in the end to kill only the leaders, about 1,000 of those uh, leading Mytilenians. Here is, let me get the book. And here is Thucydides. Okay, so what is happening here? The assembly is meeting uh, one city, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the leaders of uh, the Mytilenian, it's called the Mytilenian debate. Um, uh, Mytilene had risen against Athens and the assembly convened and they decided that they would just go and destroy the whole city, kill everyone. And that was what they agreed to, but then some decided that they had done this a little bit too quickly without much debate, whether they should reconsider how to go about it. Yes, they had to retaliate, but how? Would it be by 
targeting the leaders or would it be by by just raising the whole uh, city and killing everyone the problem was that Mytilene was not really had not in their opinion in the opinion of the Athenians had not been really subordinated to Athens they considered that they had treated it very very well better than other cities as a matter of fact and they couldn't understand why they would have um, had this uprising against Athens so we are going to find so they agreed to perhaps reconvene and debate the issue a little bit more carefully and let me read from uh, Thucydides himself they then discuss what was to be done with the other prisoners and in their angry mood decided to put to death not only those now in their hands but also the entire adult male population of Mytilene and to make slaves of the women and children. This was their first decision. What they held against Mytilene was the fact that he had revolted even though it was not a subject state like the others and the bitterness of their feelings was considerably increased by the fact that the Peloponnesian fleet had actually there to cross over to Ionia to support the revolt. This, it was thought, could never have happened unless the revolt had been long premeditated. I'll, I'll just read several passages, not the whole exposition. The next day, however, there was a sudden change of feeling and people began to think how cruel and how unprecedented such a decision was to destroy not only the guilty, but the entire population of a state. So an assembly was called at once, various opinions were expressed on both sides, and Cleon spoke again. It was he who had been responsible for passing the original motion for putting the Mytilenians to death. He was remarkable among the Athenians for the violence of his character and at this time he exercised far the greatest influence over the people and he spoke as follows. Personally I have had occasion often enough already to observe that a democracy is incapable of governing others and I am all the more convinced of this when I see how you are now changing your minds about the Mytilenians because fear and conspiracy play no part in your because fear and conspiracy play no part in your daily relations with each other, you imagine that the same thing is true of your allies, and you fail to see that when you allow them to persuade you to make a mistaken decision, and when you give way to your own feelings of compassion, you are being guilty of a kind of weakness which is dangerous to you and which will not make them love you anymore. Cleon was going to go for, let's finish them off, you know, in the words of Nikki Haley, the person who's running for president, and not only her, just his point is, look, if you're going to do it, just do it. Uh, and you have to do it completely. You cannot do it halfway because we'll have the same problem again and again and again. We have heard this from from many quarters. Yeah, this is this is his way of persuading that everyone has to be killed. Otherwise, the problem will not be solved. And this is his explanation. Your leadership depends on superior strength and not on any good will of theirs. We should realize that the city is better off with bad laws so long as they remain fixed than with good laws that are constantly being altered. This is one of his points. 
Um, as for me, I have not altered my opinion, and I am amazed at those who have proposed the reconsideration of the question of Maitaling, thus causing a delay which is all to the advantage of the guilty party. After a lapse of time, the injured party, that is we, he's talking about them, themselves, us, the injured party, will lose the edge of his anger when he comes to act against those who have wronged him. Whereas the best punishment and the one most fitted to the crime is when reprisals follow immediately. I shall be amazed too if anyone contradicts me and attempts to prove that the harm done to us by mightling is really a good thing for us, or that when we suffer ourselves, we are somehow doing harm to our allies. You have become regular, he's going to, the fact that they want to re-debate the whole thing, to him is a sign of weakness. All you can do is talk and not act, that is what he's saying. You have become regular speech goers, and as for action, you merely listen to accounts of it. If something is to be done in the future, you estimate the possibilities by hearing a good speech on the subject, and as for the past, you rely not so much on the facts, which you have seen with your own eyes, as on what you have heard about them in some clever piece of verbal criticism. You are simply victims of your own pleasure in listening and are more like an audience sitting at the feet of a professional lecturer than a parliament discussing matters of state. It's quite strong. They, he goes on and then another passage they learn they learn nothing from the fate they the Ma the mytilenians they learn nothing from the fate of those of their neighbors who had already revolted and been subdued the prosperity which they enjoyed did not make them hesitate before running into danger confident in the future they declared war on us with hopes that indeed extended beyond their means, though still fell short of their desires. They made up their minds to put might first and right second, choosing the moment when they thought they would win, and then making their unprovoked attack upon us. The fact is that when great prosperity comes suddenly and unexpectedly to a state, it usually breeds arrogance. In most cases, it is safer for people to enjoy an average amount of success rather than something which is out of all proportion. And it is easier, I should say, to ward off hardship than to maintain happiness. What we should have done long ago with the Mytilenians was to treat them in exactly the same way as all the rest. Then they would never have grown so arrogant, for it is a general rule of human nature that people despise those who treat them well and look up to those who make no concessions. Let them now therefore have the punishment with which their crime deserves. Do not put the blame on the aristocracy, on the leaders only, and say that the people were innocent. The fact is that the whole lot of them attack you together, although the people might have come over to us and if they had, would now be back again in control of their city. Yet instead of doing this, they thought it safer to share the dangers and join in the revolt of the aristocracy. Let there be no hope, therefore, held out to the Mytilenians, that we, either as a result of a good speech or a large bribe, are likely to forgive them on the grounds that it is only human to make mistakes. There was nothing involuntary about the harm they did us, they knew what they were about and they planned it all beforehand. And one only forgives actions, 
that were not deliberate. And a sense of decency is only felt towards those who are going to be our friends in the future, not towards those who remain just as they were and as much our enemies as they ever have been. Let me sum the whole thing up. I say that if you follow my advice, you will be doing the right thing as far as my telling is concerned, and at the same time will be acting in your own interests. If you decide differently, you will not win them over, but you will be passing judgment on yourselves. For if they were justified in revolting, you must be wrong in holding power. If, however, whatever the rights or wrongs of it may be, you propose to hold power all the same, then your interest demands that these two, rightly or wrongly, must be punished. The only alternative is to surrender your empire so that you can afford to go in for philanthropy. Make up your minds, therefore, to pay them back in their own coin, and do not make it look as though you who escape their machinations are less quick to react than they who started them. Remember how they would have been likely to have treated you if they had won, especially as they were the aggressors. Those who do wrong to a neighbor when there is no reason to do so are the ones who persevere to the point of destroying him since they see the danger involved in allowing their enemy to survive. For he who has suffered for no good reason is a more dangerous enemy if he escapes than the one who has both done and suffered injury. I urge you, therefore, not to be traitors to your own selves. Place yourselves in imagination at the moment when you first suffered and remember how, then, you would have given anything to have them in your power. Now pay them back for it and do not grow soft just at this present moment, forgetting meanwhile the danger that hung over your heads then. Punish them as they deserve and make an example of them to your own allies, plainly showing that revolt will be punished by death. Once they realize this, you will not have so often to neglect the war of which your enemies because you are fighting with your allies. So Cleon spoke. And after him, Diodotus, the son of Eucrates, who in the previous assembly also had vigorously opposed the motion to put the Matilinians to death, came forward again on this occasion and spoke as follows. And now Diodotus is going to give us the other side. But uh, Thucydides actually makes a point that he is going to say that to kill everyone instead of just the rebels, rebels is not necessarily a good thing. But he doesn't. He makes a point of not arguing it from a moral standpoint. Uh, he leaves the is it right. Uh, to do so, the morality of it is he is is put to to us uh, to one side. What he's going to argue is: Is it in our interest? It's mainly from a utilitarian point of view. Is it really in our interest to go and kill everyone? Think of the future. This is going to be his point. And he starts, it's not very long, I hope you can continue with me. Um, uh, Diodotus says, I do not blame those who have proposed the new debate on the subject of mightily, 
and I do not share the view which we have heard expressed, that it is a bad thing to have frequent discussions on matters of importance. Haste and anger are, to my mind, the two greatest obstacles to wise counsel. Haste that usually goes with folly and anger that is the mark of primitive and narrow minds. And anyone who maintains that words cannot be a guide to action must be either a fool or one with some personal interest at stake. He is a fool if he imagines that it is possible to deal with the uncertainties of the future by any other medium, and he is personally interested if his aim is to persuade you into some disgraceful action, and knowing that he cannot make a good speech in a bad cause, he, he try, knowing that he cannot make a good speech on a, in a bad cause, he tries to frighten his opponents and his hearers by some good-sized pieces of misrepresentation. The good citizen, instead of trying to terrify the opposition, ought to prove his case in fair argument. In a wise state, without giving special honors to his best counselors, will certainly not deprive them of the honor they already enjoy. And when a man's advice is not taken, he should not even be disgraced Far, far less penalized. Another paragraph. Yet in spite of all these, we are discussing matters of the greatest importance. And we who give you our advice ought to be resolved to look rather further into things than you whose attention is occupied only with the surface especially as we can be held to account for the advice we give while you are not accountable for the way in which you receive it. However, I have not come forward to speak about mightling in any spirit of contradiction or with any wish to accuse anyone. If we are sensible people, we shall see that the question is not so much whether they are guilty as whether we are making the right decision for ourselves. I might prove that they are the most guilty people in the world, but it does not follow that I shall propose the death penalty or annihilation unless that is in our interests. In my view, our discussion concerns the future rather than the present. One of Cleon's chief points, the previous speaker, is that to inflict the death penalty will be useful to us in the future as a means for deterring other cities from revolt. But I, who am just as concerned as he is with the future, I am quite convinced that this is not so. And I ask you not to reject, reject what is useful in my speech for the sake of what is specious in his, misleading, fallacious in his. You may well find his speech attractive because it fits in better with your present angry feelings about the Mytilenians. But this is not a law court where we have to consider what is fit and just. It is a political assembly, and the question is how mightling can be most useful to Athens. He goes on. So long as poverty forces men to be bold, so long as the insolence and pride of wealth nourishes their ambitions and in the other accidents of life they are continually dominated by some incurable master passion or another, so long will their impulses continue to drive them into danger. 
We must not therefore come to the wrong conclusions, though having too much confidence in the effectiveness of capital punishment, and we must not make the condition of rebels desperate by depriving them of the possibility of repentance and of a chance of atoning as quickly as they can for what they did. Goes on for a while and then our business, therefore, is not to injure ourselves by acting like a judge who strictly examines a criminal. Instead, we should be looking for a method by which, employing moderation in our punishments, we can, in future, secure for ourselves the full use of those cities which bring us important contributions. And we should recognize that the proper basis of our security is in good administration rather than in the fear of legal penalties. As it is, we do just the opposite. When we subdue a free city which was held down by force and has, as we might have expected, tried to assert its independence by revolting, we think that we ought to punish it with the utmost severity. But the right way to deal with free people is this, not to inflict tremendous punishment on them after they have revolted it, but to take tremendous care of them before this point is reached, to prevent them even contemplating the idea of revolt, and if we do have to use force with them, to hold as few as possible of them responsible for this. Consider what a mistake you would be making on this very point if you took Cleon's advice. But if you destroy the democratic party at Mytiling, the democracy, the, the people, who never took any hand in the revolt and who, as soon as they got arms, voluntarily gave the city up to you, you will first of all be guilty of killing those who have helped you and secondly, you will be doing exactly what the reactionary classes want most. For now, when they start a revolt, they will have the people on their side from the beginning because you have already made it clear that the same punishment is laid down both for the guilty and the innocent. It is far more useful to us, I think, in preserving our empire that we should voluntarily put up with injustice than that we should justly put to death the wrong people. As for Cleon's point, that in this act of vengeance both justice and self-interest are com combined, this is not a case where such a combination is at all possible. I call upon you, therefore, to accept my proposal as the better one. Do not be swayed too much by pity or by ordinary decent feelings. I, no more than Cleon, wish you to be influenced by such emotions. In following this course, you will be acting wisely for the future and will be doing something which will make your enemies fear you now. For those who make wise decisions are more formidable to their enemies than those who rush madly into strong action. Well, this is part of their debate. The assembly decided to punish only the leaders and not the whole population. And tomorrow we are going to see Israel's case uh, put before the International Court of Justice. Uh, I believe that most of the lawyers are English barristers, so I do not expect any of them to use uh, Cleon's uh, terms or to, to say finish them all, but I am curious and very interested to see how they put forward Israel's defense. And I'll probably, I don't know, 
I'll probably do a, a video on, on it, on my opinions. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.